Next up, we've got Selling AI, the hype, the FOMO, and the fear factor. And it's going to be chaired by Katie Guthrie from the University of Edinburgh. Over to you, Katie. Katie, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for that introduction. So, um, just to give a bit of background on myself, um, my name is Katie Guthrie, and I run the AI Accelerator Programme at the University of Edinburgh at the Bayes Centre. And we're a six month programme which aims to help develop early stage companies who are using AI in innovative ways. And over the past four and a half years, we've had a total of 74 early stage companies take part in the programme. Some of them are using AI to enhance their existing offering, but many of them are creating new business propositions that only exist because of AI. An example of that um, from our recent cohort, um, Danny Robotics is a waste recycling company uh, who use computer vision um, and robotic arm to improve the efficiency of um, packaging recycling. And that just wouldn't be possible without AI. So it's foundational for their business proposition. This session's about sales and the imposter in me feels the need to say, I am not a salesperson, but, but I see lots of companies coming through who struggle with sales. Um, and it's not something we're always that great at in Scotland. We've still got this image of the shiny suited car salesman um, as, as being something that we think of when we think of sales. Um, but if you've got a product that's using AI, how does that impact on your ability to sell the product? And the companies I work with are maybe making some early revenue, maybe not. Um, they're piloting, they're doing some customer research, they're trying to achieve that startup holy grail that is product market fit. And if you're not familiar with the term product market fit, it's pretty self-descriptive. It's about designing and packaging a product with a value proposition that meets a market need. And it's not really a linear or an absolute process. In practice, it's much messier because the world changes all the time. We have new competitors emerging, we have pandemics, we have changing regulations, which we've heard about, about today as well, um, or potentially some completely unrelated scandal about inappropriate use of AI, which impacts confidence generally. And trying to get to product market fit involves thinking through how you, develop, how you describe your product and the optimum way to sell it, which includes how it differs from other solutions. And that's probably why we see a lot of companies um, selling themselves on the use of AI. But of course, I'm dealing with startups, but the same concerns apply to established companies who are starting to use AI. And I think that's where the, the, the FOMO, the feed of missing out comes in because they see new competitors who are selling on AI. So they start scrambling to sell on AI as well, whether they actually have it or not. And public sector organisations will also have the same kind of considerations too. Their customers are citizens. Um, maybe they worry less about product market fit, but you hope that they are delivering a product and service that meets a, a, a need, a citizen need. Um, so I just wanted to um, just check in my notes, what else is I need to want to cover my intro before I go on to introducing my fantastic panel. Um, it was really just... I guess picking up on the point about companies selling on the use of AI when they are not necessarily using AI. And I wanted to mention a report that was done a couple of years ago um, by venture capital company MMC Ventures, which they published a report which surveyed um, and looked at almost 3,000 uh, AI driven startups across Europe uh, and, and did some assessment on them. And they found that about 40% of them were not actually, they were actually not using AI at all. And there's a bit of a question in there about why, and I'd quite like to try and unpack that a wee bit today. And what we're planning to do here is just look at some of these questions and considerations around how you do that job of sales and marketing for AI-driven products. But I've got a brilliant panel here um, to provide some different perspectives on it. So I'm going to get them to introduce themselves. Um, do I need to introduce you in order? I will introduce you in order <laughs> that you're sitting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barry Aitken. Um, I'm an ethics fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, so the Alan Turing Institute is the UK's National Institute for AI and Data Science. Um, and as an ethics fellow, my work looks at ethical and social considerations around the de design, development, deployment of AI, um, and also around uh, policy, uh, regulation and governance of AI. Hey, uh, my name is Roy Binney. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Lepovis. Uh, Lepovis is predominantly a cybersecurity company. We focus on using cyber deception um, to create a threat intelligence feed and buy a defender time 
from an adversary. Uh, we use uh, artificial intelligence and more specifically machine learning to help categorize these attackers and understand what they're trying to do, what nefarious acts they're performing against you. Uh, hi, I'm Jody Fairless. I'm a designer and researcher with Nile. Uh, we're a little strategic design firm over in uh, Edinburgh. Um, I, I think my relevant experience for this panel is I help people do that, like that, <laughs> that beautiful pitch that, that Robbie just gave us there. Um, I've been working with, with Katie and the uh, Edinburgh Uni team to help startups understand the benefit they're bringing to the world and then explain that a little bit better. I'm Rich Wilson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Gig AI. Uh, we use um, what we're a talent platform and we use AI to create deliverable based milestones. So we take a job, chunk it down into milestones and then match talent to that in real time. So it could be you know, for data engineering jobs, UX design, software development, and from small startups right up to you know, global enterprises use our software to do exactly that. And we were part of the AI Accelerator last year. Okay, thank you very much. And so to get started and just position it a wee bit further, we've got what is really a bit of silliness. Um, and it's a wee game called AI or not AI. So the audience have to raise their hands. We're going to go through a few products um, and logos. And I just want you to all to raise your hands if you think it contains AI or not. Um, and we've got an easy one to start with. Before I, actually, before I do this, I should say that this is not intended to cast any slurs. This is to the best <laughs> of our knowledge. <laughs> we will not be sued on it. Um, so an easy one to start with. Um, they use AI, of course, um, and probably the audience oh, Sorry, no, you were supposed to raise your hands. That was the point. Raise your hands. <laughs> Give it away. That was a test. That was a test. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, they use AI, and you know, no surprises there for the people online. Um, yes, everyone has raised their hands pretty much. I did give it away. But they don't really sell themselves on AI. It's not, if you go to the Spotify website, that's not what they're about. They're about delivering a music streaming service that works for people. And the fact that they use AI to do that is more of a means to an end rather than, than the end in itself. Um, so next, right, I'm not gonna give this one away. Does it use AI or not? That's okay. about 80% yes. 80%, yeah, for some 75% maybe. Um, yeah, so this is the Dyson Huris 360. It is a 900 pound vacuum cleaner. Um, which does sell itself on its, on its use of AI. It's, it's kind of, I guess, fairly, it's a, it's a robotic vacuum cleaner. Um, so it probably does fit into that quadrant of claims it has AI and is actually using AI. Right, next. This is the logo for a company called Babylon Health. Do they use AI or not? There's a very confident hand over here. Okay. <laughs> this watch definitely works there. Yeah. So I, I, I would say that's maybe about a third of the audience have raised their hands. Um, and again, I re refer back to my, I'm not going to cast any slurs here. I, I believe they do, but there was a, a bit of a scandal a few years ago when they, they were claiming that they were an AI-driven health chatbot when in actual fact they were not using AI. Um, it's, a, it's a kettle. <laughs> okay, nobody's really, well, there's a couple of people raised their hands. It's only in there because the completer finisher and we needed to have something that didn't claim it was AI and isn't in fact using AI to the best of my knowledge as, as, the, as the kettle. Um, famously, <laughs> the, the Wizard of Oz was, was not real. Um, I'm not going to make you do that for this, this one. Um, and then finally, this, this is us. AI or not AI? <laughs> AI. <laughs> yeah, this is us as Pixar characters through the, the wonder that is Mid Journey. Um, yes, AI was using the creation of them, but we're not delivering any. We are real intelligence, <laughs> I think, here on the panel. Um, so hopefully that's, it was, it's just really, a, a, as I say, a bit of silliness, but just to sort of set the context a wee bit more. So I will go on to the serious questions now. Um, and I think what I hope that that would raise is, is really some of the sort of definitional questions around about what, is, what does contains AI mean? So I wanted to kind of start with that, Barry, with a question to you, which I just need to find my notes, exactly <laughs> how I'd phrase it, um, about, really about what we're talking about when we say we're using AI yeah. and what it isn't too. Yeah. Is that picture still like, that picture is horrifying. <laughs> 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 and I also can't figure out why, why, why have I got, I, mean, I don't wear glasses, why have I got glasses? <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, AI, I think, yeah, it's a big, anyway, AI is a term that is used 
and like all the time, and it, and it includes so many things. It includes so much that it's kind of meaningless. It you know, encompasses so much. You know, are we talking about large language models? Are we talking about autonomous vehicles? Are we talking about a spam filter in your emails? You know, are we talking about computer programs that are processing large volumes of data to make efficient decision-making processes? Like most of the time, probably that's what it is. Um, and so I think that that is like, we still don't actually have a definition of AI. There have been lots of definitions that have been proposed um, and they all have some limitations. They all cover some things, not others. Um, and I think that is a real, it's a real challenge. Um, on the one hand, it allows us to include lots of things under that umbrella without really being clear about what it is that we're actually saying or actually meaning. Um, and on the other hand, it, it can lead to quite a lot of confusion around what, what this actually is or isn't. I think the question of, you know, is this uh, what's different from just being a, a computer program? I actually really like uh, it just being a computer program. I think that is how we should talk about it. These are just computer programs because a lot of the rhetoric or narrative is kind of trying to create this like magical idea of AI that has capacities well beyond what it actually does. Um, and I think it'd be much more helpful to just talk about, well, these are computer programs and they're doing particular tasks, particular functions. Um, not so exciting, but, but that's important because if we see it like that, then it allows people to scrutinize it and ask questions of it and really understand what it's doing rather than being kind of taken in by a mystique or you know, something that's imprecise. It doesn't actually tell you a lot about what it, what, what it actually is. What, one of the most amazing things for me was learning that the cloud was just data centers. <laughs> like, I've become a materialist about this. Like, it's just there, you know? Like, um, I, like, I like that angle on AI. Which is like, it's just going on the computer, you know? <laughs> One of the, the good things I think we've started, or at least I've only noticed in the last year or two, is when people have started being talking about AI, they've built a separate category for AGI. And that's really, really important, especially when I'm talking to my mum, uh, because <laughs> she's terrified that every time we come out with a new machine learning algorithm or something like that, uh, we're going to destroy everything and it's going to be Armageddon. And, and, and that's one of the things that I think we've got better at is describing the difference between, okay, we're making a, a, an intelligent machine that is going to get better over time at delivering X, Y, or Z, um, and segregating that off from, this is just a computer that can do everything. Uh, and that's, that's something that I think is really important. At least I've only noticed in the last little while, but. Thank you. I guess, you know, from my perspective, I always think it's, I know it doesn't cover everything, but it's the fact that it's something that's been trained on data and therefore, um, you've got to really look at how the, cura the curation and the quality of the data that's gone into it. And I think that, that to me is one of the kind of key differences. But I guess we're, we're looking here at AI and, and, and sales. So I wanted to kind of look a little bit about marketing and, and, the, and the sales process and pick up with, with John T and Rich, who, who are quite engaged in that kind of side of things, um, about why people buy. So John T? Yeah, I can give you the, the, the sales consultant answer there, which is uh, people buy things that diminish a pain or serve a need, and they buy things that do that first, or they do it better, or they do it cheaper than the competition. Um, there's a huge amount of, I would say, spam around sales and marketing, because people love the mystique of the industry. Um, I'm not in that industry, and I was taken in by that kind of uh, turbine of bullshit, frankly. Um, <laughs> And, and honestly, it, it's not that complicated when it comes down to it. Are you solving problems for people? Are you delivering outcomes they want? If you are, find a way to get it in front of them and explain it to them and people will pick it up and, and use it. Yeah, I couldn't say it better. I, I spent 20 years in sales and, and you know, it used to be very manual. Obviously now AI's changed how you sell a lot. You, know, you can write, write the copy of an email now in two seconds. You don't need to do it yourself. You know, you can, you can do it differently, but the, the essence of sales is still the same, right? Essence is finding your target customer, what is the challenge that they're trying to solve, and then being be able to propose a way, whether it's AI or not AI, it doesn't really matter, right? The customers we talk to don't you know, care, or what's where, care about what our technology does. They're just like, does it work? Investors, very different, right? So that's different. But when it comes to customers who are buying it, they could not care less about um, you know, what it does. Does it work? Does it solve my challenge? And how much does it cost? <laughs> that's kind of how it how it comes, and that's not that's not changed uh, much. As I said, the tools out there, but how you sell, massively changed. But the basic of it, just to reiterate your point, haven't changed. Okay, thank you. 
And I guess, I think you touched on this a little bit, um, Robbie, where you referred to, to your mum, but um, in terms of thinking through your, your, your customers and your market, um, maybe Jaunty from your experience, but for, for the rest of the panel too, are there certain customer demographics that respond more or less positively to um, hearing that a product's based on AI? Because we see a lot of companies who are, you know, they've got AI in the title of the company yeah, and the yeah. startup, so they clearly think it's a good thing to sell on. It, it's, it's interesting. Um, it would be easy here to say, like, well, the boomers hate AI and the Gen Zs love AI, but, like, it, it's genuinely not that simple. Um, I don't have the demographic study to hand, but it's worth thinking of AI not as a technology in the point of sales, but actually as a bit of a brand. And a brand has content, and companies need to control what that content is when they're using it for selling. The thing that I'm seeing a lot in, in some of the kind of the very early stage companies that come up with maybe AI in their name is they are using that as a, a little thumbnail sketch of something which lives in their head instead of something which is in anybody else's head. So for the founder or the developer or the creator of that company, AI means, I don't know, flexible or robust or dynamic or creative or innovative. But they're not communicating that. They're just being like, well, I'll wrap all that up in AI and I'll lob that out into the audience and they'll understand what that means. But it's not the case. Um, there's a phenomenon called the curse of knowledge, uh, which is where when you're so close to something, you cannot imagine what it's like not to know that thing. And, and part of my job on, on, with, with Edward Uni is actually helping people step back and say, well, let's imagine as best we can that you don't understand those things. Um, how would you then begin to communicate that and begin unpacking what the brand AI means for a lot of people? Um, there's a game that I used to play, and Katie will know this one, uh, when I was growing up. So I grew up in a, in a house with like one bathroom, um, and uh, you, there would always be a queue for the bathroom in the morning right before school. And what we do is we play a game called knockers and listeners, tappers and listeners on the door of the bathroom where someone would tap out a tune on the bathroom door and the person who's on the loo had to guess what the tune is. You know, just to pass the time while you're waiting, right? <laughs> um, and, and it actually turns out this is a, a, a PhD stu study that um, uh, someone called Newsom did in the States back in the 80s. But the interesting thing about that study is the tapper can hear the music really loudly in their head. Like, they can hear jingle bells or happy birthday that they're tapping out on the door. But all the listener hears is just a bunch of taps, and it's kind of meaningless. And what I'm seeing with a lot of organizations is AI in the tapper's head is singing this really loud song about what this incredible product is doing. But the person receiving the message is just like, that's just a bunch of knocks. I don't really understand what you mean. Help me understand. And actually helping people unpack AI and what it means for them and what they're using it for is really the first job I'm doing with a lot of these very early stage startups. Yeah, just, just to add to that, if I think about how we, like when we're selling our, our product, um, I agree with Johnny's point, demographic age doesn't really tend to come into it, but your job title and what you're accountable for comes into it. So for example, we're sitting in front of a customer who has a chain, they're running a chain program or they're running a piece of work, a project, and they need, they have a issue, a talent issue right there. They couldn't care less about how we're using AI. Yeah. Do not care less. Never ask us just how do you solve my problem? Because they're in they're in that kind of stress environment of I have a problem and I need to solve it. However, we then go through the, the buying cycle and there's usually in any sale, there's usually nine uh, nine decision makers or nine people involved in that. Sometimes more if it's a bigger company, but on average there's nine people involved in selling any piece of software. So in our kind of cycle you have HR. They want to know how is how does this, you know, how does your software use bias, how does it deal with bias? Procurement want to care about how much is it? And then you've got the security team, they want to know how secure is it? So everybody's coming at it from different ways, but you know, but, but thinking about it less than the demographic, thinking about every single buying cycle has those types of people, and how do you then you know, answer their different you know, objections really? It's objection handling, it's pre-objection handling. Um, and thinking about it that way is something that we, we've kind of been able to uh, not nail, but being able to have that. So if they're that demographic or they're that job role, this is what they're going to want to know and be ready for it. So I think when you're, when you're building and thinking about selling it, again, some of the, the, the kind of old school tactics still, still are worth thinking. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess, so you're talking there about sort of a B2B sales cycle, um, which a lot of AI products are sold B2B. Um, but I guess different types of products and, and AI have different risk profiles. Um, and I guess 
Vary, just picking up on that, are there certain types of kind of use where th there's more explanation required and actually you do need to say it con contains AI? Yeah, I mean, I think anywhere where there's a possibility of, of deception is really important that it's really clear where AI is. Um, you know, I'm, am I going to mention ChatGPT? I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> I <I'm laughs> swear, <laughs> um, Yeah, sorry, it's going to happen. Um, but that's like the prime example. As things have been built on ChatGPT, as ChatGPT and other kind of large language models have been integrated into products and services, there are new possibilities of deception. Um, and sometimes maybe it doesn't matter all that much, but sometimes it really, really does. Um, and it might be that, you know, a customer service line, uh, you're not talking to a human, you're talking to or you're interacting with a chatbot. Um, sometimes that doesn't matter. Sometimes it really matters. And especially if you're wanting to discuss difficult circumstances or uh, something sensitive. Um, some people are very happy to talk to a chatbot, but some people very much want to talk to a person. Um, and, and it's really important that that is clear. Um, we've already seen experiments or yeah, deployment of, of ChatGPT in healthcare contexts, in legal contexts. Um, and in these kinds of examples, it's absolutely crucial that people know what's happening here. And they know, um, you know how these systems are being used. They know if they're interacting with a person or an AI. Um, and they have choices. So they can say, actually, I'm not happy with that. Um, so I think that those kinds of examples are kind of clear. We need, it needs to be clear. There needs to be explanations and there needs to be choice enabled around that. Um, and some things, you know, it might be uh, more of an explicit choice, like a device, which is uh, you know, an intelligent you know, or, or you know, a connected device where that is kind of clear when you're choosing to buy that device or use that device that it has, uh, you know, that there's an AI element that might be clear. Um, and I think so long as the information is available and accessible so that people want to understand what's happening and importantly you know how is their data being collected how is their data being processed who might have access to that data what other things might that be being used for beyond their immediate uh, immediate delivery of a product or service like that all of that needs to be available and accessible um, but I guess not always uh, it's not always you know, like right you know right, right up front when you're accessing it but I think it's really important to have that um, available to enable people to make meaningful choices about how they're interacting with AI. Just to add to that as well, um, uh, it must be a couple of years ago now, the, there was a new law, law released, uh, the NSI, so National Security and Investment, uh, which um, targeted 17 areas of critical national importance. And we got picked up as uh, cybersecurity. I'm not sure if you did as well as part of the HR stuff. And essentially, if a uh, uh, a company, an investor, tries to uh, purchase more than 25% stake in a company or uh, acquire a large amount of voting rights and you use AI, machine learning and uh, some other technologies as well, the sort of combination of that is now a legal requirement uh, to notify the government and, and make them aware that these people are now part of um, uh, our, our investment, they, they, they can make important decisions about the future of our company. So you have to notify the, the government as well as and notifying a person when they're, they're doing that as well. <laughs> okay, go on, John. The, the one thing I, I kind of, so, so building on maybe your point there, the, the thing that we see time and time again in kind of user testing with, with AI systems is that the thing that kills customer trust, like dead immediately, is when they feel they've been tricked. People can put up with bad service, people can put up with poor experiences, but when you try and pull the wool over their eyes and they find out, obviously, that's just a, a killer for the kind of reputation of an organization. So I'm sure you have uh, had this experience before. Some of you may have done. I'm more gullible than most. But you're on a, a chat with someone you think is an agent and then it turns out to be an automated bot. And it's like, oh, okay. Like that trick, that little, little game that they play, where they substitute a human experience for actually a robot, that is the thing that does the most damage often. Um, and I think that's what I want to see, like you are talking to a robot and that's fine and I'll manage my expectations appropriately, uh, but don't try and trick me that I'm having a human interaction when I'm not. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and it actually leads me nicely on because Rich, the company you run is Gigged AI. Robbie, you're the Povis. You both use AI but it's probably more front and central for, for Rich. So I'm interested in getting the different perspectives about, about I guess, how you position yourself um, and, and why. So, Rich. Yeah, so 
We, we actually changed their name. So we, 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 were, we were called a company called Talent Exchanger first, but we got a cease and desist in our first week from PwC. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry if there's anybody from PwC in the room. So we had to change the name, and we spent a lot of time going through it. And, and you know, we were conscious that, that we were on a venture journey, similar to the Povis, we were on a, 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 a venture journey, and we picked our name. We will probably go to the point of just being called Gigged, right? Because our clients, our customers don't care about our name. But we, we are on a venture journey. And when you're early stage, you need to be able to be very, very clear. We found anyway, especially in HR tech. HR tech is a huge lead. There's, there's tons, hundreds of thousands of companies in there. It's really difficult to get funding. Um, most of them fail. Um, most of the Scottish ones fail, right? There's only, I think, three that have been successful. It's a really hard area. So we, we actually went through a lot of research. We've done a lot of user testing with user testing. Um, to, to really figure out you know, how can, what's the best way. So we decided, we made a very um, clear decision. Um, our chairman is a very, and first investor is a very, you know, ran two AI companies, data companies. So we decided, hey, we're in the gig economy. What do we do? We take things and we make them gigged, right? So we take work and then we gig it. And how do we do that? We use a combination of generative AI, machine learning uh, to do that. So we thought, right, let's just be really simple so we can hit anybody right in the face with it. This is what we do. Um, and when we're trying to get, you know, when you're on a venture journey, you need, it's a different sales, right? So if you're trying to sell to a customer, it's different, right? You're on a venture journey, you need to be able to get that VC firm or angel investor right away. You need to cut through all the noise and all the crap really quickly. So that's why we decided to use that as our name. It creates interest, it creates intrigue, and it gets us in the door. In time, do we, you know, like Spotify, you know, we'll just be called Gig, right? That's where we will go in time. Um, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. But uh, we took that, that very much to get the attention of investors. And it's worked, right? As a, there's a lot of, out there about Scottish companies that can't get investment. We've managed to be one of them. Povis haven't done it in a different way. But, so there's no, there's no one way to do it. But that was a decision we, we took. And um, you know, so far, it works. But as I said, as we go through our branding journey and our journey of who we are and what we do, that will most likely change. OK, thank you. And, and so I guess what you're saying then is it's, a, it's about selling to the investors rather than selling to the customers, and that's why you've that included that. That was the decision, yeah. OK, thank you. Robbie? Yeah. Probably fairly similarly, um, we talk to our customers about it, we talk to investors about it, um, but we find that our customers don't care about it as much, and uh, it's mostly our customers that go on our website. Uh, when we create slide decks to go and speak to venture capitalists and all that sort of stuff, we mention AI. And the reason we do that is because we kind of want to help quash any fears that behind the scenes it's just me looking at every single bit of traffic coming yeah, into your network. Exactly. <laughs> and, that, and that's what it is. It started off very much as the first six months or so I was going through and looking at, oh, these are how, this is how these attacks are happening. I'm understanding it. We're using it. I'm going to say my intelligence and understand it. And then we uh, started using machine learning to be able to mimic what me and a few of the other people in the team were doing. So we started off as it being very human central. We are looking at this. We are doing the job of analysts. Um, and then we started building um, statically typed rules, heuristics, and then moved into the machine learning side of things. Uh, probably similar to yourself. If, if you were given enough time to sit and look through the problem that, that, that Gigged uh, AI solves, you, I'm going to say you could probably do it yourself, but you couldn't scale. It just couldn't exactly. exist. Yeah. And that's why we use uh, partic uh, particularly AML, is because that's how we scale our business, and that's how we make uh, VCs uh, comfortable that we are going to be able to scale to 10,000 customers or a million customers or, or that, sort of, that sort of journey. Um, is because it's, it's not just um, people in a, in a back office and I have to go and hire 10 new analysts every time we get a new customer. And that's, that's the, the, the real benefit that we see from, yeah. from AI. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess, so we, we've, we've sort of touched on companies that say they're using AI that don't actually use AI, but what if we are using AI but we're not mentioning it? And I guess, um, Vary, just picking up is, is there a health warning that, that companies need to have some sort of may contain AI type label? Um, I think that's an interesting one. Like, I think in some cases it is really important to, like, like I was saying about the cases where there's a potential deception, it's important to say this has been, there's AI involved in this process. Um, and it's important to acknowledge where maybe a decision has been made based on 
AI, or there's AI in that process. If that is affecting you know, delivery of a service or a product or affecting you know, the service that somebody receives, it's important that they know AI was involved in that process and importantly that they can contest it. Um, that's important. Um, but I think that uh, it's more important to be clear about the particular function that, that is saying. So I think you have a label that says may contain AI um, it doesn't tell you an awful lot about well, what is that, what's it doing. Um, and you know, AI is a very misunderstood term, a very loaded term, um, and it's a term that, uh, I mean, yeah, everybody has different, different things come to mind when you say AI. Um, and so if we say, you know, this may contain AI, um, that could mean so many things to different people. So I think it's more important to say, you know, there has been, an aspect of this process has been automated, um, and what does that mean? Or, you know, there has been, uh, AI has been used to make predictions here, or to classify people into categories here, or to make recommendations. Um, this is what it has actually done. Um, this is the impact of that. Hopefully, this is how humans have made decisions based on that process. Um, and these are the ways that you can contest it and hold us accountable for how it's been used. I think that's important, more than just saying AI. Just to, to kind of bring it back to the kind of materialist point that we, we had at the start, like it, we're in a very strange period where actually the technology used to deliver stuff is becoming front and center in a lot more. Like Facebook doesn't talk about, you know, built on React or whatever. Like nobody cares about that kind of technology. But is this because this is new and exciting that everyone's like, well, we've got to talk about AI? Or is it because it's actually ethically significant that AI is in the mix? I think we're in a bit of a gray period at the moment and we're going to be moving into kind of more an ethically significant period as AI gets more developed and more front and center in some of these organizations. But right now, it's the kind of may contain AI is more, it's a social commentary than a technological commentary about what your customers are scared of and the fears that they have and the control they may feel over using a product. So for example, if I'm, if I'm hiring you, then, then I'm going to be like, okay, you've given me all these kind of threat matrices, but I need you to sit me down and talk them through like explain to me why it's come to this point. And I want something that is explicable, even if it's generated by AI. And the point where we lose that explicability in products, then health warnings probably need to come with it. But um, yeah, it's, it's a weird time because it's just tech, right? And it's delivering outcomes, but it's now become almost flipped in a way. I think, you know, we've got the, the watchwords of the Scottish AI Alliance, um, trustworthy, ethical and inclusive here. And I think you touched on that earlier about actually that makes good business sense as well because um, you don't want to just be honest. It's not the only reason you're honest about, about the fact you've got AI and how you're using AI, but actually um, if you've got that statement of, of, of what you're doing, then it can help build consumer trust, which ultimately is what will air new sales as well. I mean, you have to have a good product as well, but yeah. Okay, um, okay Jonte, um, I'll come to audience questions in a wee minute, but um, because you work with quite a lot of different companies, I just wanted to ask what sort of factors do you think companies should take into account when they're making their, their decisions about marketing their product yeah. and how should they go about understanding how much to play AI into that? Um, so I'm a researcher. That means that my answer to this is go talk to people. Like that's allowed. You you can go and talk to people. It's not that hard. <laughs> so whenever whenever uh, an organisation comes to me and says, uh, you know, we don't know how to go to market with this product, the first question I'm asking is, oh, well, who have you spoken to? Like how many customers have you interviewed? How many people have you surveyed? Um, this idea that you have this sort of magical tech product that you then need to launch into market and there's no way of knowing whether it's going to work or not, people are going to buy it is is oddly out of step with the kind of research technology which is out there these days. Um, one of the things that, that kind of amazed me when I first started working in research is that you can speak to about 12 people and that gives you a pretty good idea of what that kind of go-to-market strategy ought to be and the kind of things you need to bring into consideration. There's, there's something called kind of ROI, which is return on insight. Um, and the first interview you have with someone about this is like, wow, it's just like a wall of new stuff and new information that you couldn't imagine coming at you. And then by about the 10th or the 12th or the 15th, you're not really learning new stuff. You've got all the different perspectives involved. And you can start to synthesize that to say, like, well, here's all the kind of talking points we need to be working with here when we come to marketing this product. And, like, everyone on the panel has, has done this work, and, and we push teams to do this work through the kind of accelerated programs that we run as well, and the, the co-foundry that Nile works. Um, and it's extremely basic. Like, it's not rocket science. You write a discussion guide. You work with a company like... 
uh, Taylor McKenzie. They're here in Glasgow. They're a great recruitment company. Write that, write that down. I, have no, I don't get any profit from recommending them. We just work with them a lot. Um, they will find people that you want to speak to, uh, offer someone a 50-pound Waterstones voucher, and they will tell you everything you want to know about anything. Um, and the change that comes across companies before and after research is my favorite thing about working in this field is that you just you start with blank faces and you end up with just like so much crosstalk and conversation in the room. It's incredible. Um, so yeah, go talk to people. <laughs> That's the secret, the secret source of marketing is just go find out. Okay. Anyone, anything to add? I'll go to audience questions. Okay. Oh, question. um, <laughs> there's a question here about um, when is it useful to use AI as a selling tool and when is it not so useful? So are there, are there circumstances in which it, you, you want to avoid it? I think the investor point is interesting that you spoke to there, Rich. So um, what we find is that customers care about outcomes, obviously. So what, what can you do for me? How can you solve this pain? How can you meet this need? Do it with AI, don't do it with AI. Hire a team of 400 people to do it. I don't really mind. Can you give me what I need? The AI piece is really, actually really valuable when it comes to investors at the moment because you do start to cut through the noise. Um, but AI is a brand that no one really has control over. It's going through a massive hype cycle. I'm not sure you noticed. Um, and what that means is that the investor's opinion about AI switches when ChatGPT has another scandal or where the Llama model that Facebook released gets you know, leaked onto 4chan, as it did a few months back. Um, how you feel about AI as an investor is probably going to shift and change. So the real thing you want to do, I think, is probably kind of take a temperature of the room that you're in around AI. If it's customers, it's less important, usually, because most people are like, well, explain to me how this can help me. But with investors, it's a lot more like, do I want my name associated with this technology? And often, AI, you just need to kind of water down the brand a bit like this is not Skynet this is actually just about scaling this is about efficiency yeah you think about John you said ROI I think ROI definitely right I think it return on investment right being a sales guy traditional I use traditional. yeah traditional I use <laughs> ROI so you think about customers they want a return on their investment so if they spend 30 grand with you they usually want a 3 to 10x return on that investment right I'm talking B2B again because that's my background you talk about an uh, investor they want a they want a 50, 60, 70, 100x investment, return on that investment, right? So if you think about ROI, that's when your AI or not messaging comes in, right? So how do you use AI to help create that ROI and how do you then articulate it? Has Robbie done a good job of doing How do you create a really good articulation of how you use AI? And it's different. So how you explain it to the customer and how you explain it to your investors, there's two different, two different. One's looking for hype, they're looking for formal, using the title, right? That's for investors. Investors, you need hype and you need FOMO, right? You know, FOMO is the biggest thing you can create with an investor. Trust me, right? I, um, but with a client, they don't, you don't create FOMO with a client, right? That's old school sales tactics, right? I was a car salesman when I was 19, right? So um, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't work anymore, right? But when it, comes to, when it comes to the client, though, how do you use it? How are you explaining it? And then what's the ROI on that investment? And, and, and that's, that's, that's how I think about it when, it when it comes to explaining how you do it. So if you use AI, you've got to explain how you do it and not just say, well, yeah, we use it, but don't want to talk about it. <laughs> that's not going to work, right? I think also, I guess, like, I mean, with, with all the hype and all the, the excitement about AI, there is a tendency to, to want to say, like, let's do something with AI or, you know, let's make a new product or service, let's do it with AI. But that is not the right approach. <laughs> AI is not going to be relevant to, to everything that you want to create or sell. And I think that there is a real worry uh, at the moment, I mean, it's longer standing, but particularly at the moment of a lot of companies wanting to just, and, and not just companies, also public sector organisations, you know, across the, across the board, there's a lot of uh, excitement to, like, let's do something with AI because everybody's talking about AI, so let's do something with AI. Um, and, of course, really, you want to start with, well, what's the problem we're solving? Yeah. Is AI relevant? Does AI actually address that? Uh, which kind of AI, because again, that means so many things, but it shouldn't be AI for the sake of AI. It should always be, you know, is this the best way to solve the need to create a new product, to deliver a service, um, or are we just putting in AI because it's buzzy and exciting? Sure. Um, and that's not, that's not sustainable. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. So when I was sitting doing quite a lot of our uh, under, uh, understanding of threats of our customers when I was doing it manually, um, the, the whole thing there was, I can explain how I've got this answer. 
now I want to not have to sit and do this and do another part of my job um, every day instead. Let's get the machine to be able to do it for us. So if we need to explain it, we can sit and talk about the manual process that we did as well. And, and, and we've managed to just now get a machine to do some parts of that. OK, thank you. I've got another question here about how would any of you tender expectations on LLMs for business people to prevent disappointment? Barry? Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I mean, that's where we're seeing all, all the hype and excitement focus at the moment, particularly chat QBT, but also, you know, large language models broadly. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of... Uh, expectation and hype around what these might offer and, and also in some cases unrealistic fears about what they might lead to um, and I think we are still very much in this this you know this this heightened phase of, of experimentation and and it's not just you know there's a the fast pace of innovation of getting these models out but then we're also seeing uh, a real rush to then deploy them in all these different circumstances without really thinking about why we're doing it what the risks might be or whether that's the right thing to do um, and we're discovering that you know all kinds of, of risks and potential harms that come along with that, but also the significant limitations. I mean, these are just their language models. Right? All they can do is predict patterns in language and provide, you know, what are the most likely next sequence of words. They're no, they don't offer factual accuracy. They don't offer analysis. They don't offer anything beyond prediction, statistical prediction of combinations of words. Um, and I think that that, like that, that needs to be understood really clearly that we can't expect them to do more than that. Um, and yeah, at the moment we're seeing this rush to deploy these in lots of contexts, domains, sectors where they uh, potentially could add value, but I think the kinds of value they might add is in uh, particular narrow, narrow tasks that are not the level of excitement that we're seeing. Um, and I think when that hits home, it's going to be <laughs> maybe, maybe disappointment, um, but, but that realism, like what, what are we expecting these things to deliver? And they, they, they're language models, right? They're going to deliver, and uh, yeah, maybe in terms of, of more um, conversational customer service, right? uh, uh, things like that. But, but we're seeing these like such experiments or ex expectations that this is going to go so far beyond that, and it's, it's, it's not. Yeah, oh, it's going about to be tried. adding value, just to add to your point, Barry, think about adding value. I remember 12 months ago, blockchain was going to change the world, right? Blockchain was everywhere, and every I was in I, this time last year. I was in San Francisco, and I was at a, a startup grain conference, and every single investor was investing hundreds of millions into blockchain companies. Right? Um, there are a lot of those companies. FTX was one of them. Went under, but a lot of them went under and didn't get investment because they weren't solving a problem. The blockchain can solve some real. There are a few examples of it. Not many. There's a few. There's one or two. Right? I said there's a. Um, there is a one in Glasgow was a really good one that used it. They actually sold it to Nescafe. Really cool. Um, that's one. I think that's there's maybe two in the future. But there's one, there's one Glasgow fine. one. <laughs> but you, it's the same thing, right? Blockchain was everywhere. It's going to change the world. But then when it when it's petered out, actually, there are only a few use cases that add in value in business or to the consumer. And it's the same, you know, as to Mary's point, LLM, right? Once it all comes out in 12 months, 24 months time, where is that? Where are those use cases? And they are probably quite narrow, right? As I said, we are using it very much in one tiny use case of qualifying a job spec, right? And a deliverable. That's a really tiny um, use case. It's prob we don't see it going that much wider than that, right? We see it, and I think that's okay, that adding value and how much value does it add? And that, then that's where I see it going. So the, the, the terrifying thing for me around the large language models is let's look at the context they're growing up in. Let's be kind of really realistic about it in that the internet is a tool now for surveillance advertising. Like, that's what the internet does. Um, we may not like that that's the way that it works, but that is the way that money is made on the internet. Google, Facebook, it's just surveillance advertising. Um, what does large language models let you do? It lets you tailor, it lets you accelerate, it lets you just boost the amount of bullshit tailored to people that you can push out into the world. So my biggest fear here is that we're just going to see a doubling down of maybe the worst kind of things that we see uh, on the, the internet today, in that it's going to become a lot easier and a lot cheaper to do that at speed and at scale with a level of specificity to anyone's individual persona on the internet that is kind of terrifying. Um, the, the light at the other end of the tunnel is that, well, let's not think about business, let's look at what kind of individuals are using it for right now. And there's some really beautiful examples out there. So, uh, a friend of mine 
um, was in hospital a few weeks back and uh, got his chart before the doctor could come and see him. And he put what was written on the chart into ChatGPT and asked it to translate it for him. And it put it into like good, easy to read, easy to understand English. And then he could have a meaningful conversation with the doctor about it afterwards. Now, don't use it for medical anything ever. But like in that context, it was an interesting application of this. And I know that some of the people in our, in our office are using it to kind of simplify very complex emails and to speed up the way that they communicate with people. Like these, these little, it's not making any money for anybody, but they're really quite useful little applications in people's personal lives that, that help people do things they couldn't do before. But yeah, <laughs> it's terrifying, <laughs> frankly. I'm, I'm conscious of time. There's, there's um, a few more questions coming in, so I'll maybe just go for one of, oh. <laughs> so apologies um, which was just to Vary's point shouldn't we insist on in clarity in language e.g. it's not generative AI it's regurgitative AI which is a <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I like that I think, I think that's good like being clear that this is not creating new I mean, generative in this meaning expect to make it's create new outcomes but the out outputs are only uh, yeah, mimicking what's gone before you know, it's based on patterns of what it's been trained on um, and it's based on all the limitations and biases that it's been trained on. And we need to be really, really clear about that, that this isn't something neutral or objective. It is um, going to produce certain worldviews, reproduce certain perspectives um, and opinions disproportionately compared to others. Um, it's not perfect. It's not uh, neutral. Um, it's a tool that we could maybe use in some specific circumstances when we understand it and when we know the limitations of it and being clear about that. Um, and I think at the moment the conversation is, is so blown up by, by the hype um, and also you know, this narrative of there's a, lot of, there's a lot of rhetoric around you know, whether this might lead to AGI or this might, which I'm very sceptical of by the way, but it can lead to AGI or that it's you know, leading to the possibility of something which is like conscious or that can create new outputs. And, and all of that is putting the focus on like what is AI capable of, or like there's some kind of inevitability around what AI might do in the future, and distracting the focus from the, de the decisions of the developers of the organisations who are designing, developing, deploying these. And we need to be focusing on those decisions um, rather than kind of unrealistic ideas about what AI could possibly achieve in some uh, far-fetched, hypothetical sci-fi future. And, and just picking up on, on that and the point that I think John was making earlier, there's maybe a, a business opportunity there for someone who does a very good job of cutting through all that. I, I was bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, so I wanted to kind of do my own little sales pitch towards the end of the, 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 the time. Um, going back to the point I made at the start, I am not a salesperson, but... Um, we at the, at the University of Edinburgh, we have just reopened applications for our AI Accelerator programme. Now, obviously, I am totally biased, real intelligence, but totally biased. It's a great programme. Um, the applications are open until mid-May, and we'll be starting a pro the programme in September with 12 AI-driven early-stage companies and the three themes that we have, which are climate, health, and AI for good. It's open to companies with no pre-existing relationship with the University of Edinburgh or indeed with pre-existing relationship with Scotland. Um, we give you a stipend, we give you lots of support and we don't take equity. So what's not to like? I mean, it, it's fantastic. Um, so if, you're, if, if you know of a startup or early stage company who might be interested, um, let them know, come along to the base centre, stand out there um, and get some more information about the programme. Um, and I guess... Uh, you know, we, we pulled together this because many of the companies who come through the AI Accelerator, sales is something that they, they wrestle with and how to, how to describe themselves. So um, this is just one example of some of the many interesting topics that we, we cover on the, on the programme. Um, and I guess just to, to, to think back, to reflect over what we've been discussing, um, I guess the, the point we started with, it's not an end in itself. AI is absolutely a tool to, to solve problems. And actually, when we're selling, that's what, that's what we need to be focused on, which, um, you know, not the, not the means to the end. Um, 
and customer research has certainly come up as, as so there's no right or wrong answers about how you do it. You just need to understand what it is that your customers want. Um, and I think the last point I'm going to make really is that when you're in the toilet later today, when you're rushing for your train and you hear these knocks, <laughs> just try and think about what tune it actually is. It is so a, it's a legit scientific experiment. Do it at home. It'll amaze you. So thank you to our panel and to you for listening. <laughs> Thanks so much, Katie. That was brilliant. And thanks so much to all your amazing panellists.